Hi everyone, I'm Aram Mokumov and this is another episode of Off the Record. I'm here with Jeff Dennis, who's the entrepreneur in residence at Faskin Law. He's a serial entrepreneur, best-selling author and speaker. Uh, Jeff was the author of uh, Lessons from the Edge back in 2003 about the biggest mistakes and failures founders make over and over again. He has also co-founded the Toronto chapter of the Entrepreneurs' Organization. Jeff, great to have you on our show. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, first question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, first question I have for you is, um, so as I mentioned, you published the book Lessons from the Edge. Um, uh, what drove you to write it in the first place? Well, um, you know, I, I guess it, it came out of um, a lecture series or, a, you know, a, an event. Uh, so I was very actively involved with EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization. I was a leader here and I was a global leader and I was quite, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid. So I went to all their conferences and, you know, really absorbed all the education. And every so often there'd be a speaker where it was, I used to say there was more sizzle than steak. You know, like guys with shtick, magic shows and card tricks. And and there's some kind of business lesson in there somewhere, but it's, you know, it's kind of hokey. And I was sitting through one of those presentations in the audience, like rolling my eyes, you know, talking to the guy next to me, not really paying attention and sort of said, there's more knowledge in this room than on that stage. And the, the light bulb went off and I said, you know what? This is what we're going to do. I'm going to, you know, convene a panel of people who made mistakes in business and share what they learned. And I'll do like, I'll model it. I'll do the first one. And uh, so everybody knows, you know, to be candid and open and, you know, because you go to these conventions and everybody's got their, you know, their mask on. The, the, the biggest, the best, the smartest, the richest, the, you know, most successful. And then everybody's at home crying in their pillow, right? Like, <laughs> and, it's, and it's for everybody. It's, you know, it's a quite lonely at the top as an entrepreneur. Anyhow, we did this and it was a huge success. And, you know, people were crying and there was, you could hear a pin drop because people were very candid and very open and it became a tradition. So then it was very accidental. So then I got involved with the Kauffman Foundation, which is this nonprofit sort of campus like organization in, in the U.S. that's focused on entrepreneurial learning. And I was on an advisory board and I'm at a meeting at a retreat in Arizona and they're looking for ideas for books for a Kaufman series of books and everybody's got ideas and brainstorming and whatever. And then I sort of said, you know, lessons from the edge. We do these panels, blah, blah, blah. You can hear a pin drop. People are crying and they said, good idea. Let's do it. And I became an author and, uh, it, it you know, what I learned through the process is that the mistakes that people make, are pretty common. Like, I'm not saying there's a limited number of mistakes you can make. I'm sure people can come up with new ones. But some of them are just the same over and over again that people make, not the same people, hopefully, but that's pretty common. Mm -hmm. And why is that? And the answer that I think we came up with is that people are making decisions with limited resources. They don't have enough people, they don't have the right people, they don't have enough money, they don't have time, whatever it is, they don't have enough of it and they're making tough decisions on the fly and they make mistakes. And it's as simple as that. And then our book is uh, basically five chapters and, and, and there's 10 stories per chapter, so 50 total stories. And the first chapter is kind of on leadership and then the second is um, people, like employees and, 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 you know, that sort of thing. The third is uh, finance, so bankers and investors and stuff like that. The fourth is um, partners. We could have written a whole book on partners. And the fifth was the personal side, health, mental health, fitness, family, values, spirituality, that sort of stuff. 
And so that's, that's what it became. And I, I put out a, a call because lessons from the edge had been, become sort of a thing and people knew it and, oh, like I get that still today. Oh, you're the lessons from the edge guy. Those are things that are awesome. I learned so much. I'll never forget the one in Cleveland where the guy said whatever. Um, and so it, it just kind of snowballed and took on a life. And, and I, it gave me a huge sort of life experience in that, not that there was a lot of money in writing a book, but um, I traveled the world speaking to business groups and meeting people and hearing their stories and trying to, you know, sort of being a bit of a student of business. And it just broadened my horizons, built my network. Um, I just learned a ton and I got to go to cool places. Uh, I, you know, one time I spoke to an EO chapter meeting in Kathmandu, Nepal. Okay. Like wow. I've been everywhere. So it's been quite an interesting kind of ride. I, I call myself the accidental author because I never really set out to write a book. And the irony is that my wife is her first career. She was a writer, a copywriter, and she always says she's had a book in her and that I write a book first. <laughs> she's, she's since written one. But uh, but anyhow, that's a, that's another story. And, and Jeff, I, I wanted to ask you, you never did a sequel to that book. Would you want to do one or you think the lessons? Are yeah, I, I thought about it. So I, I gave it a lot of thought. Yes. Yes. Um, and what I came to the conclusion was that there's no money in books. Like unless you're, uh, you know, Obama or Michelle Obama, right. there's no money in books. And that most people are publishing, they're self-publishing, and it's really like a marketing tool to support something else you know it's 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 a way to build the brand a personal brand of a ceo or something like that but today like with what's gone on with the publishing industry and digital and video and social and all that like there's no money in books so you can write a book and it it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and there's no return other than i suppose you know the learning that gets disseminated it's like the, it's like the music business like it's it's everybody's getting it for free so it's um yeah. i decided that i wasn't going to do it for that reason having said that i i had a really interesting experience um during the pandemic you know i'm my role at fask and i'm sort of the outside guy trying to bring in business and help clients and you know be outward facing it's tough to do in a pandemic right because <laughs> i'm stuck in my attic here um, but anyhow, I, I got involved with a bunch of different groups and one of them, uh, does these, uh, they call them, uh, deal huddles. And so they convene different people from, you know, there's some are themed, it could be an industry related or general or whatever. And it's people looking for deals, have deals and they put them together and it's some heavily moderated kind of thing where, you know, there's 15 people on a zoom call. And everybody's like, what do you, what can you give to the group and what do you need from the group? Right? right. So I'm on one of these calls just by the by, cause I'm, that's my way of getting out of my attic during a pandemic. And on this call out of like, there were 25 people on the call. It was an evening call. So that could be a wider range, like globally, you could have Asia on, you could have Europe on. And, um, anyhow, on that call, there were 15 people who were stories in my book. It had never happened before. Like I, I, I it was, I, I had like goosebumps. Like it was kind of weird. Like where did this happen? How, it was just one of those fluke, like lightning struck kind of things. It was kind of cool. Um, but what was interesting, and I had been in touch with some of them and some I hadn't seen in 15 or whatever years. And, but the prevailing lesson was they all made comebacks, whatever, screw up they had they were back on top every one of them had a great comeback story mm -hmm. some greater like big comeback stories and others you know less so but still back on top in some way so that would be an interesting uh sequel is you know kind of the where are they yeah. now maybe it's a the podcast comebacks. maybe it's a <laughs> podcast maybe it's a video series i don't think it's a book because nobody wants to read books <coughs> excuse me and, and so jeff i wanted to ask i mean um 
through your experience writing that book and everything since then, because you get to speak with a lot of entrepreneurs of all sizes, of all companies and things like that. And so I'm sure that you, you mentioned some of the biggest, mis the biggest lessons entrepreneurs make around like partners, um, you know, revenue and things like that. What would you say are like the top three that, you know, you would keep coming back to the, or the ones that, you know, from a pattern perspective are the ones that are re repeat the most oftentimes? Well, I'll tell you one thing I see with um, emerging fast growth tech companies in particular um, is the partnership problems. You know, you get a couple buddies from school or they leave a job together or whatever, and, and they're working on a project in their basement and they're 50 50 partners or three or, you know, 33 33 or 25%. And, and you don't really think about anything beyond like, you know, the product at this point, like what's the product, then you got to worry about product, you know, customer fit, and then you got to scale and blah, blah, blah. But right now they're just here. But those people are not necessarily the same people that are going to go on that long journey. And more often than not, they're not the right people because they got to get a job because they can't afford to stick it out or they're not, they don't have the same ambition or they don't have the same values like they're not good people like they're liars or they you know and so you end up with wrong people very often and then it's a mess to get out of it and it makes it hard to run a business hard to finance a business hard to sell a business hard to grow it. like it's just it's a disaster and it happens so often because people and, and the one thing we noticed is that people spend more time hiring and interviewing you know in the in, in hiring than they do with co-founders because everybody's focused on the business and the product and they're not really focused on like what's everybody's role and you know what's your timeline here and how much you know runway do you have and all those kind of fundamental questions you're not talking about it you're talking about the widget or whatever it is you're building and, and you, you hire people and you go through, you know, interviews and you do assessments and you, you know, you have multiple interviews, you get into bed with a partner, it's like a, a one night stand and now you're stuck. So wh why, why do you think people don't realize this until it happens? It's the passion and, and the naivete. And then also, I think sometimes people lose sight of why we're in business. Um, another sort of like uh, symptom of the same thing is that people tend to give away too much equity. You know, um, I mean, I can think of cases where, you know, people raise multiple rounds of financing. They finally, you know, sell the company. They're left with like 12 percent. Right. Um, and you got a board and you got, you know, so like careful what you ask for. And I think. A lot of that self like awareness because not everybody's cut out to be the CEO of a public company or of a VC backed company or a, or a PE owned company like there's a certain lifestyle that you're you know taking on and people don't think about it they're just thinking about maybe sometimes it's ego sometimes it's money sometimes it's greed some like everybody's got Ego's the worst. Like if you let ego drive you, that's a that's a that's destined to failure. Like that's I that I see a lot of that too. And uh, regarding the partners or the equity side of things, like what what because that seems to be like I think the main the main uh, mistake I think people make these days. What what guardrails do you recommend putting up to make sure that these mistakes don't happen? Well, I guess first and foremost, make sure you know who you're getting into bed with, like kick the tires, um, figure out whether they share your values, whether they share your timeline, whether they share your work ethic, whether they, you know, like, are they going to be there? Like I always said to my, my partners in business, I could tell who was going to be there to turn out the light if things went bad, right? Like, you know, who those kind of people are. I'm that kind of person, but lots of people aren't 
And so, you know, if you're founding a company, like you got to have that kind of stick to itness and and passion and and commitment. And it's tough. It's not like everybody, you know, it's it's become glamorized to be an entrepreneur. You know, when I was starting out 30 whatever years ago, if you said you were an entrepreneur, they thought you were a con man. Like it didn't have the same cachet. This is before Apple and Microsoft and right? So it's it's come, become like a, these guys are like cult figures. Everybody wants to be Elon Musk or you know whatever. It's not like that. That's one in a billion and to get there it's tougher than you think. Yeah, I think so first don't. I yeah, yeah, they don't get it. And and so first know your partners. You know, do the hard questions. Ask the hard questions. Um and then if you're intent on going ahead, you know, have some kind of you have to have a shareholders agreement and you might consider having some kind of you know reverse vesting arrangement or vesting arrangement meaning that you know people will have to perform certain obligations whether it be there be there for 4 years or deliver some kind of deliverables or whatever but that their entitlement to these shares are uh you know are conditional on on that taking place. Mm -hmm. And so at least, you know, if it doesn't work out, you know, yes, you had a step back, but at least you didn't lose your equity. And some big loser owns 20% of your business forever. And then what? Now, if you have a shareholders agreement, you might have a shotgun or buy sell clause or something so you can get rid of them and buy them out, but it's a lot cheaper if their equity gets reverse vested or doesn't vest in the first place. Because then you don't have to get into all the legal mechanic mechanics. What are I, I don't know if you've ever been asked this question before. What what are some of those hard questions a founder to founder should ask each other? Well, I mean, you know, like it's like getting married. It's a pretty big commitment. Like, I mean, you're in business. Do you? Have, I don't know about your partners and and, and your relationship with them, but. Like, like you guys are shoulder to shoulder, I assume. And you know, when there's problems, you close the boardroom door and hash it out, and you know, then come out with a common front. You know, so you got to be able to do that sort of thing and know that the the people that you're working with and you trust, you know, will stand with you and share your views, share your vision, share your values. So you have to. I mean, it's 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 not that complicated. It's just you really have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's you know it, it, probably not good legal advice, but it's probably a good idea to have a fight, <laughs> right? Like, see what happens if you're in a fight. Do they fight fair? Do they listen? Yeah. Do they compromise? Like right, that. like stuff like that. Because if if you, if they don't compromise, because at the end of the day, like. The legal stuff is only there if the shit hits the fan, right? Like everything else in business is negotiated. And you only call in the lawyers when it's like a problem or you're selling or financing where there's mechanics that you can't do that you need an expert to do. Mm -hmm. But day-to-day -day business, you know, if you've got disputes, you got issues, you know, yeah, you'll read the lease, you'll read the employment contract, but at the end of the day, it's got to be good faith dealing with these people. And that's most important with your partners because like the corporate law doesn't give you a lot of flexibility if it's, if, you know, if, if they got a veto or, you know, you need 66 and two thirds to make a decision and this guy's got 40%. Now, you know, you either, you either convince them to vote along with you or you're stuck. So that's negotiation, that's relationships, that's trust. That's, you know, in some ways you should be able to speak for each other. Like, you know, if one, that you're a little bit interchangeable because your values are the same, the story's the same, the vision's the same. You got one guy running around saying one thing and another person saying another. I mean, you know, A, you get into legal disputes and B, you know, the culture and, you know, so it's all really kind of fundamental. And, you know, 
things like retreats where you go spend a weekend together and have some kind of facilitated conversation might not be a bad idea. Um, you know, there's a misconception because of technology that you can start a business with nothing. You can't. You do need resources and usually some money, right? Like people just think if you have a laptop, you're in business. It's not like that. And so, you know, people are stuck with partners because they're missing resources and they need, have, need people to bring that to the table. And I guess the last thing I'll say on this topic is there's also some challenges around valuation all along, but mm -hmm. particularly at the beginning, because now you're valuing sort of what's the company or the concept worth versus what's his contribution or her contribution worth. Just because, you know, there's three of you doesn't mean you're worth 33 and a third percent. Right. Like, how do you measure that? Right. Some, sometimes there's conversations about, you know, I need a technical founder. Well, if you had $500,000, you'd hire somebody or you'd outsource it to a dev shop or whatever. So, okay, so it's worth $500,000. Well, this company, you know, is going to be worth 50 million or 100 million one day when you exit. So what's that 500,000? What should it be worth to him for mm -hmm. him to have taken that provided that contribution and taken the risk of not getting paid for eight years. And there's a time value of money there, but people don't kind of go through that kind of mental gymnastics, I don't think. It's three guys, a third, a third, a third. But when you when the rubber hits the road, you, you start to say, geez, I overcompensated this guy. Like all he did was build me my demo MVP and he owns 30% of my business. I must have been out of my mind. Yeah. Because you've since hired a whole dev team and you've got, you know, whatever. And then this guy like can't even lead that team, maybe. Jeff, th uh, thank you. I wanted to ask. Um, <laughs> Don't I get ask me this. started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I can see you're getting heated on. I love it. Um, you've talked to hundreds, if not thousands of entrepreneurs over the years. If there was one thing that you would want them to ask you, but rarely or, or never do, what would what would you want them to ask you? Huh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll tell you what I think's missing with some on not all, but some entrepreneurs, and it and maybe even like for me at the beginning of my career, you you lose sight of why you're doing it. Like, what's the why? And I mean, there's a bunch of whys. There's, you know, maybe your business, you're solving some problem in the market or, you know, something like that. You know, that's what's his name, Cynic's why. But my why is like, why for you? Like, what's fulfilling for you? What's meaningful for you? What's important for you? And at the end of the day, when you cut through all of it, what are we doing here? We're trying to provide for our families. Period. The rest is marketing, is culture. But when you cut through it all, like, what are we doing this for? We're trying to feed our families. You know, some people come from other countries here for opportunity. Some people, you know, had a silver spoon, but still got to make a go of it. Some, you know, everybody's just trying to provide for their families and whatever that looks like. Some it's just eating and some you don't want to create some kind of legacy for their children or grandchildren or whatever. But that fundamental question, like, what are you doing it for? Why? I don't think very many people think about it till they hit some kind of midlife crisis or, or some other crisis. Because you're too busy in the trenches, you're busy, you know, product customer fit, culture of the business, like all these other important things, don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, like who's looking after the leader because yeah. right. that it's lonely at the top. That's for sure. Like, who do you have to talk to? And that's why organizations like YPO and EO and, you know, tech and Vistage and all the rest of them, that's why they exist because it is lonely at the top. You need somebody to talk to, you need somebody to, you know, work on some of this self-awareness piece because at the end of the day, are you going to be happy just because you built a company and sold it? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, is that the meaning of life? That's a good follow up question I have now on that. Um, what's like the one life advice you tell entrepreneurs beside business? So like, aside from like the partnerships and, um, you know, the equity, the culture, whatever, the product market fit that you have to figure out, what is the life, is life advice you would uh, you tell them? Well, I mean, what we were just talking about is part of it, but I think the sort of higher level piece, and again, this was part of our book, chapter five, the personal side. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the top lesson there was balance, right? Like have balance, listen to your mother, you know, get lots of sleep, eat properly, get exercise, have some kind of spiritual part of your life, have relationships and, you know, have balance and work and have balance because at the end of the day, like, what's it for? Like, really? What's it? Why are we doing this? I mean, I hate to get sort of like philosophical, but, you know, like I've seen guys make tons of dough and go through five wives and, you know, and they're not happy. I've seen people who have nothing, who are very happy and content. So it's got nothing to do with success and money. So I, I, I just don't, don't think it's correlated. So it's if like business is fun, business is, you know, there's a lot. And I'm not saying don't be in business. I'm just saying be in it for the right reasons. Yeah. I I uh, 100% agree. I've seen the same thing in you know networks and family friends, business friends. Same thing. You would think that they have all this money and all the success that they're happy in life, but actually they're some of the most miserable people I know. So my it's, wife it's is a, my wife is a psychotherapist, and I have no idea who her clients are, what they talk about, but I can tell you she's busy with like these issues. <laughs> uh, and the pand- yeah. and in the pandemic, it was even like she's up. 30% probably. Yeah. Uh, so. Jeff, I want to ask you, what in your eyes makes makes a difference? What is the difference between a good entrepreneur and a great one? Hmm. Well, people used to ask me, what am I looking for in entrepreneurs? And um, I think I'm looking for people who are lifetime learners that they're open, that they want to learn. I'm not saying I have the answers. I don't always. Sometimes I, my, my advice is let's go figure out where to get the answer. But I find that some entrepreneurs, for whatever reason, it's immaturity or ego, again, um, you know, don't want to appear um, like inadequate. So, you know, they act as if we all do. I mean, listen, we all do. But if you're if you do so in a way that prevents you from listening and learning and surrounding yourself by people that are more knowledgeable and experienced than yourself, like you don't want to be the smartest guy in the business. So I think that's a problem. And so the guys that I like to work with are people who are like sponges. They want to learn. They, they read. They go to conferences. They join organizations like YPO or EO or whatever. Um, they, you know, they, they try to hone their craft and, you know, follow best practices, whether it's the EOS system or, or one of these other, you know, philosophies of business. Um, they're just trying to do better. And they also are good at delegating and leading. Leading is really about delegating and, you know, helping people reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. And those are like, and and as I said earlier, at different stages in the business, it's different life skills. Like it's different skill sets. The, The guy that can get something off the ground is different than the person that can scale it and, you know, motivate a team of, 200 people in remote offices or whatever it's and i'm not saying you can't learn it but who the hell is good at everything (laughs) right like i'm not that's so i think uh... so you have to be willing to be humble and aware self-aware and 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 allow yourself 
to not be the smartest guy in the room. The best no, guy, example of that that I've come across, so he'll be happy for me to say it, is Razor Sulman. Oh, who's really? The okay. founder. Re well, I don't know what, you know, he, his philosophy and style is now. I'm not kind of in his business these days. You know, I, we were friends, but back in the day, I was like his prime advisor when he was starting up what became Achievers. So I watched him. And what I admired most about him was exactly what I'm saying. He was a sponge. He was open. He listened. Yeah, he wanted to debate and argue and challenge, which is perfectly fine. But the end game was to learn and figure it out and to surround himself with better people. I'm not saying he was perfect or everything was a good decision, but that approach, I think, is just m more successful. And more satisfying. No, I think entrepreneurship is definitely a lifelong journey where you're constantly learning. So that is that is very true. Um, jumping back to something you said earlier about, you know, uh, from a partnership perspective where you need to bring on a technical co-founder and, you know, debating the rationale, whether what's that worth longer term versus like hiring a company to help build out the tech. Have you actually had any instances where it worked out with technical founders like successfully? Yeah, but I can't think of one that's, um, I, I, you know, no comment. I, 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 no I, I mean, I just don't have a, I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, I'm sure so I could rare. think of it if you, <laughs> well, you know, I just find that that it's a again it's a different skill set to run a team of developers than it is to build an mvp right right like that it's it's the old saying like the worst thing you can do is make your top salesman the sales manager because the skills of being a good sales person yeah. are different than managing a team of sales people it's the same with you know software i assume that somebody who's you know good in the trenches coding is not necessarily the same person who can lead a team who can d design architecture and i don't know like I, I i don't know enough about software but i i think that's the problem i i mean this is my realm so to speak so like i i do agree when you think of an an mv like a minimal viable team to build out your mvp that technical person on a team is probably maybe not co-founder material for a CTO role if the company's successful, right? Um, so right. a lot of our clients do work with us to build out their MVP, uh, to figure it out first, validate it, and then if successful, get you know external capital and hire their own team to manage you know a scaling team. So um, I just I was curious to ask this question because I come across that all the time and. You know, your response kind of made me understand that. Yeah, it's there's not that many success stories. <laughs> well, the technical well, they bring a unique skill. Usually, they're kind of gig people, right? Like the the because they're available, you know. Um, so they're not really they haven't built teams and they haven't managed teams. Like just don't. I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions, and you know, especially where there you have instances of serial entrepreneurs where they've you know cut their teeth. But more often than not, I find that, that the MVP guy isn't the, you know, five years in the CTO. And there's a real issue about the MVP person taking, you know, instructions from the new boss who in the corporate ladder is got, you know, 1% and this guy's got 15% and yet he's his boss or her boss. Yeah. Um, Jeff, just a couple more questions before we wrap up. I wanted to uh, talk about something you mentioned uh, to me before, um, which I think was the context where you said that the best alternative to no agreement is BATNA, I think it was. Yes, yes. Um, can you explain what that is to the audience and how it works? Yeah, so BATNA, B-A-T-N-A, -A, stands for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. 
And basically, it's the concept when you go into negotiations, you have to have a plan B. Because if you have no plan B, then they got all the bargaining power. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a very simple concept, right? So the idea is, what's your alternative? What's your best alternative to making a deal here? Where else do you have to go? What else do you have to do? And if the answer is nothing, then take the deal and shut up. <laughs> if it's if it's if you do have an alternative, okay, let's sit down and talk because I got alternatives. I got options. So I mean, obviously, I'm being facetious, but that's kind of what you got to be thinking about in the negotiations. I mean, and that's another thing. Negotiating is a whole other skill set. Like, not everybody's good at negotiating. You know, some people. You know, I, I, my brother-in-law. We went to Morocco uh, mm-hmm. on a vacation. And he loved bargaining with the carpet guys. Yeah. And it was hilarious. And I didn't really have, I mean, I understood it from like a technical negotiating, like I've studied negotiation. I've read all the books. So I knew what was going on, but I don't have the stomach to like run out of the place and have the sales guy chase me down the casbah. And, and, you know, no, no, no. And then they go for lunch and the guy chases us to lunch. And then finally, like, he buys the carpet for like two cents on whatever he asked for. And I paid like three times what he paid because I just didn't have the stomach for it. Right. You know, that it's a skill. It's a, it's in your genes. And I don't know. It's People have it and some people don't. I don't really particularly like bargaining. But I understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. So... It's an important skill. Okay, cool. Um, I do agree. Negotiation is uh, some people. Me personally, I'm not the best negotiator. I uh, I don't have the stomach for it either. Sometimes, but uh, as an entrepreneur, I think you just have to know how to do it at least, and you know, be comfortable doing it as, as like a baseline. Um, I I agree, and I think what you have to do, like because I, I my my instinct is kind of not to be confrontational and not, you know, be that way. Um, it, I found by being sort of a student of negotiation and trying to understand like what's going on makes it a little easier for me to do it because I'm not thinking in terms of rejection or the emotion of it. I'm really thinking about it almost like a chess game. If I say this, they're going to say that then I counter with this and then we settle over here. And you kind of play it out and think about, you know, sort of the the, the dance. Right. Then I find it easier. And I'm also good at coaching other people because, you know, then they can tell the bad news. I don't have to do it. That's true. Um, Jeff, l- last question for you is um, what would you want to uh, depart this episode with by telling our audience your final message? I don't know. Um you know, I just think that uh, we're in the age, like, we're, I'm a big believer, you know, people say to me, like, wh- why did you were in so many different industries when, when you were in your business? And the answer is that I have this philosophy of sort of riding waves, as opposed to fighting waves. Mm-hmm. And so I've tried to, I, I hit a few waves, and learned the lesson the hard way. So I've decided long ago that I'm tr- going to ride waves. So then the question is, is what's the way? What are, where are the ways? What are they? How do we ride them? And so that's kind of my perspective on these things. So, you know, I learned for a guy my age and sort of technical, lack of technical skill, I was a fairly early student of blockchain and cryptocurrency. For whatever reason, I realized that there's a wave coming. And so I started to read about it and I started to talk to people about it. And then I brought speakers into the Faskin and we, they lawyers started to learn about it. Next thing you know, we got clients and we're now experts in, you know, at least as expert as you can be in something so new. Um, but, you know, I sensed the wave and then we, I jumped on it and then business ensued. Um, so, you know, that I'm busy looking at waves and and I'm not saying like I'm future shock or some kind of, you know, visionary futurist guy. I'm actually using it in the trenches because I find that knowing how things are going, you know, you want to be in a business that rides that wave that doesn't, that fights it. You know, 
I used to have, I had, I remember, never forget, about seven or eight years ago, I had a guy come into me with an app that was going to be for like taxi cab companies. And I, and I said, like, are you kidding me? Like, you think this is the end game? You think that the future is, it involves Beck Taxi and Diamond Taxi? Like that, 10 years from now, there's going to be armies of these cabs. You think that's the future? I don't like, right. So what's the wave here? Decentralization, gig economy. I mean, all these trends waves, you know, what are they? Let's ride them. So that's what I look for. And when I look at companies, I kind of try to look at it through that paradigm, not only because obviously you want to know that there's good management, it's financed. I mean, there's lots of factors to success, but fighting a wave is not one of them. I think that's a awesome advice. Thank you so much. Like wh- I'll tell you what, when the pandemic hit and everybody was dazed and confused, me too, by the way, I'm not saying I'm a genius. The first call I made was the head of Vaskin's insolvency group hmm. because I knew there's going to be a wave, right? Can't pay your landlord, can't pay your employees, right? How many companies were going to have to go bankrupt or talk to somebody about it? So. Hmm. I wanted, I wanted to figure out, okay, well, how do we do? Like, I'm going to get calls. What do we do with them? Because I could see the wave coming. So, I mean, that's not a good wave, but if you're a bankruptcy lawyer, it's, it's the only wave wave. you got. (laughs) Yeah. Business heading their way, right? That's so true. Jeff, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and, and giving this awesome advice with us today. And, Thank you to everybody who's watching our show and subscribing and supporting it. We'll be back with more content. Thank you again, Jeff.